I'd like to welcome everybody to our biostatistics final study group. My name is Pat Dunn and I'm a peer mentor for the Biostats 6125 and 8125 course. And I'm joined by one of my colleagues, Dragan Dragonic. Dragan, are you still on? Okay. Hey, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. And so, like I said, for those of you that just um, joined in, if you could put your phone on speaker just for the sound quality because we are recording this and we're going we're gonna to post this later. I'd appreciate it. So thank you, everybody. And like I say, feel free to either use the chat function or to stop me and ask questions if you do have questions during the session. I'm going to work from this PowerPoint, but I do have SPSS all loaded up here and ready to go. So some of the concepts that we're going to talk about is just final test preparation. We're going to take a look at the decision tree, um, review graphs, review some of the final test values, not the answers to the finals, but uh, results that you get when you, when you do a, a statistical test. Uh, we'll try to do some demonstration and interpretation, but then really open this up for you for, for Q&A. Dragon, have you been able to join us? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, anything you'd like to add as we go? Okay. All right. So not, not right now, but yeah. Okay. So the first thing is um, just really getting organized in the test preparation. The best thing you can do, the best advice I can give you is go back through your weekly uh, assignments. Go back through the step-by-step -step guides. The final test really is very similar. It kind of mirrors those, those weekly, those weekly um, assignments. Uh, you might even need to go back through and just redo some of your homework. Look at the um, feedback that you got from your professor. I'm getting a lot of feedback. I'm going to put everybody. I just put everybody on mute, but me. If you can send me a t uh, chat that that you're still hearing me. Okay, very good. Yeah, I don't know if you are all getting feedback. I was getting a lot of feedback in, on, on my side. So what I'd ask is I'll try to pay attention to the, to the, um, the chat function here uh, for questions. And then if you do have a question, you can either use the chat or I will um, uh, open up your line. And I will try to remember also to, I think I can... I'm going to try to unmute Dragon. I don't know if that's possible. Can you? Okay. Yeah, I think you're, everybody else is muted except you, Dragon. Yeah, yeah. I, I okay, good. So, again, to start with um, just final test preparation, go back through your weekly assignments. Uh, review those notes. Um, you might even want to go back through and just, you know, rework the problems again. Uh, just to get comfortable with it. Um, go back through the, the graphs and, you know, practice, um, you know, doing the graphs again. Uh, you just had a quiz last week that really emphasized the decision tree. You're going to want to go back and, and take, a, take another look at the decision tree. Take a look at the interpretation of results. Um, and again, look at the look at all of the resources. The videos in the resources section are also very good for helping you figure out how to uh, produce output in SPSS. And again, you know any of the any of the guides um, are good resources. Anything else on that, Dragon? 
I just wanted to mention here that when uh, performing hypothesis tests, uh, everybody should explicitly state the null and null uh, so that it's clear uh, what is being done and which test you choose to do. from the, the left and go to the right. Um, you know, look at the, the type of test. Are we looking at uh, descriptive statistics? Are we looking for testing differences? Or are we testing relationships? So if we have uh, descriptive statistics, are we looking at numerical values? Or are we looking at ordinal or categorical values? And that'll help you drive the types of tests um, or outputs you're looking for. If we're testing differences, you know, is this um, a one group mean? Are we looking at um, two groups? Or are we looking at more than two groups? And as you know, if we're looking at more than two groups, then you're going to be looking at the an analysis of variance. If we have two groups, then we have the t-test. And then again, within the t-test, we have related or paired samples, and then we also have independent samples. Um, you may have to also look at the type of data. Is it interval data or ordinal? And you may have to go to some non-parametric tests uh, if necessary. On the um, we also have uh, categorical values. You may have to use the chi-square or the cross tabs. If we're testing relationships, then we're looking at correlation, uh, linear regression, or logistic regression. Any questions, comments from Dragan? Um, not, not here. No. Okay. The next one is graphs, and this is going back to week two of the um, of the course. I can pull up my MSPS authority up here. So, oops. So, uh, for graphs, we're, we're going to the graphs, going to leg legacy dialogues, and then you select the type of graph that you're looking for. So, for example, if it's a scatter plot. I'm going to select simple, and then you're going to put your values in the ranges. So, oops. I'm getting them in the wrong box. There we go. And then you click OK. And then in SPSS it'll produce, produce your graphs. So the main thing is to go back, go back through your study guides and you know really really use those as, as models when you're doing your um, graphs in the final exam. Question on graphs? Okay, but, um, <clears throat> the other thing is looking at um, final test values. So we have um, descriptive statistics, uh, odds ratios, confidence intervals, and then um, you know, we have t-tests, analysis of variance, and so forth. So again, go in here to descriptives. So you, you're going to go and analyze descriptive statistics, and then go to descriptives. Select your variable. Click OK, and then it'll run your statistics. And you can select which types of, um, in the options, what types of values you want 
you want the uh, calculations to be based on. Uh, the odds ratio, that was in week three. If you remember the study guide. So you're going to produce a, a two by two table. And if you remember, you can do, there's two tests. There's the odds ratio and also the relative risk. Um, they're all based on the same data, um, A and B in the exposed, C and D in the not exposed cases and controls. The only difference is the equation. So in the odds ratio, it's A um, it's A over B. Yeah, so A, A times D over B times C. And in the relative risk, it's A over A plus B divided by C over C plus D. Questions on types of tests. Going to uh, confidence intervals. I remember if you have a, a bell-shaped curve, um, you know, you're, the confident, if, we, if you've selected a 95% confidence interval, then that means there's, there's a 95% chance that the values are going to be within, within that range. Um, any comments on that, Trigon? Uh, I just wanted to add the uh, calculation of the odds ratio and the uh, confidence interval in that case can be kind of tricky to calculate because you have to deal with, um, uh, with the square root and the, and the uh, quotients and the logarithms. So it's really important to go over those calculations a couple of times to make sure that your um, logarithms are correct because uh, that was kind of tricky for a lot of people when we did that back in week, whatever week that I think it was week four. Yeah. So it's very important to be very careful with the logarithms. It's easy to make mistakes there. But that's, I'm talking about getting the confidence central for the odds ratio. Any questions, comments? OK. Um, and then again, for the, you know, the types of tests, you know, just remember which type of test you're using. So uh, for example, with t-tests, go and we'll compare means and we have a paired t-test in this example so you're going to go after, before in your variables select OK and here's an example so we have um, you do have your 95% confidence interval here, uh, and you also have your significance level here. So this is for a paired t-test. Now if we're going to do a independent t-test, same thing, analyze, compare means, and you go independent t-test, you're going to put variable in your group. It's going to ask you to define your group, so you have to look at your data. So you have ones and twos in this case. So group one is one, group two is two. If it's males and females or M's and F, F's, then you tell, you tell SPSS what those are. And now you have your independent t-tests. You have your significance level, you have your um, upper and lower, your confidence intervals. There's uh, chi-square, it's in the EDU. Analyze. A chi-square is a non-parametric test.
remember with a chi-square you have to um, put in the values. So if the first cell was 20%, they have to add up to, to 1. So it would be 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0.2, and that runs your chi-square. Next we have analysis of variance. Oh, the question that can be about the values, I just had them committed to my memory. It was from the step-by-step -step, uh, for that. That was in, uh, that's problem 6.2. This was the, the chi-square that we had done in that week, and those were the, the values that I put in the, in the chi-square. Okay, we have if we're doing an analysis of variance. Again, we're comparing means. One way ANOVA. We have our variable, a dependent variable, and our grouping variable. We have some other options here to select. So we want um, in the example we wanted descriptive statistics and the homogeneity of variance test. And we also wanted to do some post-hoc testing. <clears throat> There's some examples here. In the sample, we did the LSD and the Bonferroni. If you do them all at once, then it'll do all the calculations at one time. So we have our confidence intervals, our test of homogeneity of variance, our ANOVA with our level of significance, and then we have our multiple comparisons. So all of the, all of the different combinations, um, non-smokers, ex-smokers, and so forth. And then you can see the significance level and the confidence intervals in each of those cases. And then the last one I want to show you is the um, correlation and regression. Again, we go for a correlation, we get just a simple correlation. So we have sodium and blood pressure. And it gives us a <coughs> correlation. If we're doing a linear regression, then we're going to go regression, linear. And then we have sodium and blood pressure. We have some other options to consider if we want to add a R square. We need other plots, other options, and then click OK. And so again, we have our R, our R square, and our significance levels. So those are just some examples of some of the tests, um, test values. Um, Antragon, do you have a, um, any comments on this? Uh, yeah, I think you, you covered uh, you covered all of it. I just wanted to add um, a couple of things about the independent t-test and the bare t-test uh, when one is comparing two uh, population means. Always look at the SPSS will give you the confidence interval for the difference between the two population means and you should look at that confidence interval and see if zero is included in that confidence interval or not. Right. If zero is included, that means that you, you basically need to, uh, well, you, it means that you cannot reject the null hypothesis, meaning that it's plausible that the two means are not significantly different. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Just look at those confidence intervals. It's really, they're really uh, very informative. Uh, if you don't see zero included in those confidence intervals, I'm still talking about the difference between two means. That means that the difference between the two means is significant. Um, for 
the uh, odds ratio, though, uh, the, the value to look for is 1. You have to make sure that 1. If, if the association between two variables is significant, uh, 1 should not be included in the confidence interval for the odds ratio. Okay. Just something to keep in mind. <laughs> So when you're trying to interpret your data, some um, things to keep in mind. First of all, the, again, the class guides, the step-by-steps, use those as a, as a model. Um, can you use those as a, as a model for figuring out how to answer the questions on the final. Um, but what you're looking for is in the sample, um, what is typical? What are you expecting? Is it deviating from the norm? Look at the variance. Don't just look at the means. You know, and don't just look at the... Um, p-values or the significance levels, look at the variation uh, in the data, in the variance. Uh, how are the data distributed in relationship to the, to the variables being measured? So is it a, po is it a positive or a, a negative relationship? Uh, look for, you know, have you found a statistically significant relationship? In most cases, we're using p of less than 0.05 or a 95% confidence interval. Um, then also look at other things such as um, normality, variances, um, you know, and other ways to, other concepts that were, that are described in the book. I've already done a couple of the uh, demonstrations. Um, we talked, you know, looking at one-sided versus two-sided tests for a hypothesis, uh, establishing confounding effects, um, the homogeneity of variance, and then um, Multiple uh, comparisons. So if you're looking at more than two groups, like I said before, you cannot use a t-test. You have to use an analysis of variance. There's a question about the, um, the data sets. The data sets that I was using in the samples are, were from the step-by-step -step guides. Uh, they're not the data sets um, for the, the final itself. Um, but Again, use those, use the step-by-step -step guides, and use the um, your homework assignments and the, the weekly applications, and look at the feedback that you got from your instructor. And between the two of those, that'll really help you in modeling how to do the, the problems for the final. Um, like I said, we looked at t-tests in week five, um, the odds ratio, um, different types of t-tests. Uh, we looked at uh, confounding effects. Um, this was in the uh, week 10. So um, a couple of things to keep in mind as far as whether something is a confounder. So to decide if one variable is a confounder to the relationship of two other variables, uh, first of all, does the significance of the variable change when we add the other variable? So if it, you know, if it goes from significant to not significant, for example, or the other way around, then um, that's something to keep in mind. Also, does the relationship change directions? Does it go from a positive to a negative? And um, again, just looking at whether it changed, changed the relationship between the variables. Did it make it, um, did it turn it into a significant relationship, for example? Um, homogeneity of variance. This is when we did the analysis of variance. See if I can pull that back up. You notice here I selected homogeneity of variances. And this is uh, not a significant uh, value here, um, which means that the, the, two, the two samples, um, you, you can evaluate you can use this test to evaluate these, these um, data. Any, anything on this, Dragon, on homogeneity of variance? Um, uh, yeah, but you, you're, you're hoping here, when you, when you do the test of homogeneity of variance, you're hoping that your significance level, um, well, your p-value will be, actually, I'm sorry, that the p-value will be more than 0.05, uh, mm -hmm. 0.05, because you do need, you do need, that's one of the assumptions in the analysis of variance that, all, you know, that all the uh, population variances are um, more or less, you know, um, close or, or equal. So you do want to have a pretty high uh, p-value here. 
Yeah, so if you notice here on this sample, so the homogeneity of uh, variance, the significance was 0.548, which means it was um, not, those groups are not significantly different as far as their variance. And then when you look at the ANOVA, okay, now you have a significance level of 0.42. And what that means is that there is a significant difference within those, um, those groups that are being tested. It doesn't tell you which of those groups. That's why you have to use the post hoc testing. And you have to go through all of the different combinations here and look at, look at the significance levels and look at the uh, confidence intervals to evaluate which ones of these um, have these significant relationships and which ones don't. So you can see here there's a 0.026 that's less than 0.05, uh, but a 0 0.590 obviously is, is not. So some of these are significant and some of these are not. And again, we talked about, um, um, you know, with using multiple comparisons. Um, I'm not sure if I have that PowerPoint up. So from here, I think we'll just kind of open it up. Um, I'll keep my eyes on the chat box. If you have a question, send a chat, and then I believe I can unmute you or you can unmute yourself. To ask, or you can just ask the question directly in the in the chat. And while we're waiting for those questions to queue up, any any additional thoughts, Dragan, on getting ready for the final? Um, all I wanted to say it's really important to write out uh, when you perform a hypothesis test to write out all your hypotheses. Tell your the, the reader which test you're using. Um, everything has to be nice and structured. And then at the end, interpret all the results that, that the SPSS will give you. Therefore, always answer the original questions yeah. in the problem, you know, whether you're rejecting or not rejecting the null hypothesis, and what exactly does that mean, so that, it, uh, so that you have a nice, uh, nice picture of what's going on in each problem. Yeah, what I found, with, especially with statistics, is true of any, any course that you're taking. But really look at what questions are being, you know, what, what questions are being asked. And then literally take it one step at a time. You know, sometimes the questions seem overwhelming when you look at it uh, at face value. But then, you know, take a breath, figure out which example in the step by step step it it mirrors the best, and then then start from there. Okay, we have a question about interpreting logistic regret regression, um, especially when the values are negative or less than one. So I'm going to try to find the logistic question, regression, step by step. Is that in week 10? This multiple linear. Why don't we go from here? Logistic regression. So the question going back here was if the values are less than one. Yeah, let me just, let me see if I can. So, I guess I need some white space for that to work. Oh, okay. If you can see the... how to interpret the logistic regression, especially when the values are negative or less than one. Uh, 
I don't see anything on that. We may have to do some additional research for you. So, Carrie, I'm sorry I don't have an answer for you. I'm going to have to do some research and it might be something we need to ask your professor for more, more information. Oh, it's the question is if the odds ratio is less than one. Okay. Okay, uh, there was a request to go over the decision tree one more time. Again, this, this looks like a very, very busy page, and it is. But just literally take it from left to right, the purpose of the test. So ask yourself, are we looking at descriptive statistics? Are we trying to test for differences? Or are we trying to test for relationships? Okay, so starting with the descriptive statistics, you have uh, both numerical um, statistics like um, you know the mean, standard deviation, and so forth. And then you also have uh, ordinal or categorical, and you can use bar charts and pie charts and so forth for descriptive statistics. If you're looking at testing differences, then you're asking yourself a couple of different questions. First of all, how many groups do you have? You're also asking yourself what kind of information. Is it um, numerical or is it categorical? So if it's numeric and um, a simple one, one group or two groups, then you're looking at t-testing. If you're looking at more than two groups, it's analysis of variance. If you're looking at um, categorical values, then you're looking at chi-square. And then if you're um, testing relationships, um, again, if you're, if you're just looking at the relationship between two, two groups, then you're going to be doing your correlation coefficient. If you have two groups or more groups, two or more groups, and you're looking for, you have a dependent and independent variables, then you're doing linear regression, multiple linear regression. If those groups are in categories and not um, numeric, then you're going to be looking at uh, logistic regression. And going back up to this quadrant here, again, if you have tests for differences and they are um, interval or ordinal values versus numeric, then you may be looking at some non-parametric testing like the Wilcoxon, um, the Mann-Whitney, um, as, as alternatives to the ANOVA or the uh, t-tests. Other questions? Um, the good news is uh, this time next week you all will be finished with biostatistics. So I know for, for many of you biostatistics is a, is a challenging course. It is kind of a core, um, you know, um, you know, concept for public health. So you're going to be using these, the, even though it may not seem like it, you're going to be using this, the, this skill set, you know, for the rest of your career. So, um, again, some final thoughts on re preparing for the final. I know you all have your final already, but go back and review your step-by-step uh, -step guides. And also just get comfortable, just practice around in SPSS. The more you get comfortable, I mean, even for me, I just have to kind of poke around and put some variables up there and, and get comfortable using, using the format. The more comfortable you get with it, the easier it will be for you to, to produce. Dragan, any um, final uh, comments for you? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to say that we read every problem very carefully, make sure that you know what you're being asked, know how to identify the dependent variable and independent variable, um, you know, what are the... Uh, predictors of the sometimes same regression, but, you know, so just read the problem, problems very, very carefully before, you know, before doing them. And then check and recheck your results to make sure that yep. what you're saying really makes sense at the end, too. 
before submitting, you know, because once you submit your final, that, that's it. So it's really important to go over your whole work a uh, couple of times and make sure that everything is in order. We had a question about the, the relationship between the LSD and the ANOVA. So I have back up on my screen the an analysis of variance that we did. Remember there was four, four groups, non-smokers, ex-smokers, less than half a pack, and more than a half a pack. When we do the ANOVA, it gives a significance level of 0.042, which means there is a significant, you know, we have a significant finding here. But it does not tell us where that difference was. If this was a t-test, we would know there's a difference between the two groups. Since there's four groups, we have to do post hoc tests to determine where those differences are. So we look here, and these, this is just, these are two examples, the LSD and the Bonferroni. There are other post hoc tests you can use, but it's going through each of the examples, from non-smokers to ex-smokers. It gives a significance level, um, 0.9, and um, zero is included in the confidence interval, so you would conclude that there is not a significant um, difference between these two groups. But going down to here, X smokers to more than a half a pack, we have a significance level of 0.026, so that's less than 0.05, and we have a confidence interval here that is um, that does not include zero. So this one we would conclude is a significant relationship. That's, that's the difference between the ANOVA and the, uh, the post hoc test, the like LSD. And the question, how do we determine which variable is dependent and which is independent? So um, I think those are defined in the book. The dependent is the, I may get this turned around, you may have to help me on this. But the dependent is the is what you're introducing. Um, so, like, if um, for example, if we're going to do an exercise program for weight loss, the uh, the exercise uh, as the intervention is the dependent variable, and the the weight loss would be the independent variable. So it's the the independent is the output of the um, right. of the study. Yeah, the outcome is usually. Um Whatever you're interested in studying, that's a dependent variable. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, if I want to know how does blood pressure depend on salt intake, then salt intake is independent variable and blood pressure is right. dependent. Usually, um, you have that's why you have to read the problem very carefully because they do tell you that kind of impl implicitly what is dependent variable and what are the independent variables. But yeah, it takes takes a bit of experience to recognize that right away. But you have to be really careful. I mean, um, and that's we're getting comfortable with SPSS. You know, play around. If it doesn't, if the output doesn't look right, then always go back and go. Okay, if I flip these around, does the output look differently? And um, you know, that that usually can help you. Other questions? Okay, I think we're going to wrap it up for this evening. I would thank you all for participating. Um, if you need to review this, we will. I will um, post the recording of this once I have it up on um, the screencast. So I want to thank all of you, especially Dragan. But I want to thank all of you for participating in this um, review session.